Are you a chronic fault finder? Or maybe just a periodic fault finder? Think about it. Habit, habit, habit. Has this habit made you happy or miserable? Have you ever thought about this? Would you like to part with this negative, health-destroying partner? Sometimes we have to divorce bad habits. Let us do a quick review of the journey from Kadesh Barnea, where they murmured the des deserting, depressing desert in the south of the Negev. Loretta says Israel traveled down the Arabah, that is the driest and the ugliest part of the entire journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. Can you see them walking away from the Promised Land to their back? To this depressing surroundings, sometimes the road of life are very depressing. And you know, it's a, at times we are very unsympathetic to our rebellious friends. Why are people rebellious? But once we learn of their hardships, the kind of road of life they are traveling, our attitude changes. Don't be too hard on people. Be hard on yourself. Can you see them struggling over deep sands and stones? When I travel here, I, I try to imagine their emotions. They were reaping the results of their own stubbornness and distrust in God. God does not actually punish us. Uh, uh, it's the results of our way of life, the way we think. Araba, the root is RB, which means dry, burnt up, and therefore a wasteland. In Hebrew, you don't have uh, vowels, just consonants. And you have have to put in the vowels. And this is difficult for translators. It is so ugly that uh, actually it becomes beautiful. <laughs> After a while, you get used to it. And you see the beauty of God all over. Their self-reproach made their journey even more unpleasant. self Reproach is health destroying. Watch out, don't be too hard on yourself. Soon after leaving Mount Hor, the Israelites suffered defeat in an engagement with Arat. He was one of the Canaanite kings. They earnestly sought for help from God and he refused them. No, God never refuses us when we ask for help. This victory, instead of inspiring gratitude and leading the people to feel their dependence upon God, made them boastful and self-confident. Success and victory can be dangerous. How important is an attitude of gratitude? Soon they fell into the old habit of murmuring. Oh, the sound is so ugly. They were now dissatisfied because the armies of Israel had not been permitted to advance upon Canaan immediately after their rebellion at the report of the spies nearly 40 years before. Negative thoughts create more negative thoughts. And this is health destroying. They thought their journey in the wilderness an unnecessary delay, reasoning that they might have conquered their enemies as easily then, as now, you know, don't go back. Regretting is also health destroying. It's gone. Don't worry about the past. As they continued their journey toward the south, their route took them through a hot, sandy valley, destitute of shade and vegetation. The road less traveled. Maybe you've read the book. <laughs> The way seemed long and difficult, and they suffered from weariness and thirst. Again, they failed the test of their faith and patience. Are you with me?
Is this my problem? Is this your problem? By continually dwelling on the dark side of their experiences, they separated themselves farther and farther from God. So my dear friend, be careful. By beholding whatever, we become changed into the same image. Hmm. Don't concentrate on the faults of others. Becomes yours. They lost sight of the fact that was it not for their own murmuring when the water ceased at Kadesh? Was it not? Uh, they would have been spared the journeys around Edom. God had purposed better things for them. Their hearts should have been filled with gratitude to him that he had punished their sin so lightly. So if you reap the consequences, it could have been worse or more likely, depending on our attitude and our performances. But instead of this, they flattered themselves that if God and Moses had not interfered, they might now have been in possession of the promised land. Silly, <laughs> negative thoughts destroy us. Please try and think of the positive side of life. After bringing trouble upon themselves, making their lot altogether harder than God designed, they charged all their misfortunes upon him. Tell me, are we blaming God at times? Thus they cherished bitter thoughts concerning his dealings with them, and finally they became discontented with everything. Have you met certain people like this? Discontent with everything. Oh. Slavery in Egypt looked brighter and more desirable than liberty in the land to which God was leading them. Negative thoughts, my dear friend, destroy us. As the Israelites indulged the spirit of discontent, they found fault even with their blessings. <laughs> Can you believe it? Right here at this place called Punon in the Bible, the following words were uttered and I was here. You know, when you get to these sites, the story becomes alive. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Can you hear them? For there is no food and no water. It's a lie. And our soul loathes this worthless bread. Negative thoughts can destroy you. Be careful what you allow in your mind. It was God's power alone that had preserved them in that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water. God's power can carry us through the most dangerous deserts of life. This is what they suddenly saw while they were murmuring. Wow, for the first time. They saw it. Are you scared of snakes? <laughs> Every single day, God protected these ungrateful people from these deadly snakes. We call this divine mercy. We're not aware of the dangers of life. We don't see them, but they are there. In God's leading, they had found water to quench their thirst and bread from heaven to satisfy their hunger. He gave them peace and safety under the shadowy cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. What a God. We should concentrate on the many blessings. Angels had ministered to them as they climbed the rocky heights or treaded the rugged paths of the wilderness. Can you see them? Notwithstanding the hardships that endured, there was not a feeble one in all their ranks. Can you believe it? Forty years, no sickness, no disparance. <laughs> their feet had not swollen in their long journey. I travel so often and 
feet of people, their ankles get swollen. But this, it didn't happen here. Now they had their clothes grown old. Can you believe it? Wearing a shirt to trousers for 40 years and still brand new. This is the God we serve. God had subdued before them the fierce beasts of prey and the venomous reptiles of the, of the forest and the desert. What is going to happen if they continue complaining? And what's going to happen to you and me if this thing becomes chronic? If with all these tokens of his love, the people still continue to complain, the Lord, with, the Lord would withdraw his protection until they should be led to appreciate his merciful care and return to him with repentance and humiliation. Are we content? Godliness with contentment is a great gain. And by the way, there are always blessings around. Look for them and enjoy them. In their ingratitude and unbelief, they anticipated death and how the Lord permitted death to come upon them. What a sad story. The poisonous serpents that infested the wilderness were called fiery serpents because of the terrible effects produced by their sting, causing violent inflammation and sudden death. As the protecting hand of God was removed from Israel, great numbers of people were attacked by these venomous creatures. Watching the goats and sheep here at Punon, where it all happened, where fiery serpents appeared, I thought of the following verse. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Do you think the Lord would listen to these ungrateful rebels? Hmm. Think he will listen to you and me. The people became humble before God. That's the best place to be. Knowing that the accusations against him were false. Loretta says, the kaleidoscope of God's forgiveness, his love and his pity surpasses all the beautiful colors of Petra that you're looking at right now, by far. How is God going to solve this complaining problem? I was going, how is he going to solve my pro a complaining problem? Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Wow. That's so easy. Now the word translated pole is used as a military standard. In ancient days they also had standards, different standards. And you know, this is a reminder of God, our general, who leads us through the desert to the promised land. He's got his standards. Let's follow his standards. Uh, it occurs in Exodus 17, 15, Yahweh Nisi, Yahweh my standard, also as banner, Psalms 64, Enzyme, Isaiah and standard, Jeremiah. The pole was high enough to be seen throughout the camp. God wouldn't like them to miss this event of, of life. So it was highly elevated. The symbol of God's victory over sin had tremendous healing power for those that looked at it. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it, put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, he looked at the bronze serpent and lived. The people knew that the serpent was only a symbol of the healing Savior. They also realized that it was not sufficient 
simply to look at the serpent. But that looking must be accompanied by faith, since there was no healing in the serpent itself. It was possible to gaze at the image without being healed. It was possible. That to exercise faith in God as the divine healer. Did you get the message? Similarly, similarly, the offerings in the past, which not accompanied by faith, were unavailing. Faith is such an important a component in our spiritual lives. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus uses the event that happened in the wilderness to teach you and me, as well as Nicodemus in those days, a wonderful lesson. May we prayerfully search our own hearts as we study Israel's reactions to God's healing invitation. Are you sick physically, chronically, spiritually? We have a healer. We're not without hope. Now there was terror and confusion throughout the encampment. In almost every tent, with the dying and the dead, none were secure. Trauma. Often the silence of the night was broken by piercing cries that told of fresh victims. Pray unto the Lord, was their cry, that he take away the serpents from us. All were busy in ministering to the sufferers, or with agonizing care, endeavoring to protect those who were not yet stricken. No murmuring now escaped the lips, the lips. When, when compared with the present suffering, their former difficulties and trials seemed unworthy of a thought. Hmm, I like this. We think we've got problems now. Uh, or if we had problems yesterday, uh, it could be worse today. Don't complain. Only a little before that accused Moses of being their worst enemy, the cause of all their distress and difficulties and afflictions. What was Moses going to do now? Moses was divinely commanded to make a serpent of brass resembling the living ones and to elevate it among the people. To this, all who had been bitten were to look and they would find healing. He did so and the joyful news was sounded throughout the encampment that all who had been bitten might look upon the brazen serpent and lo. Can you see the message of the gospel in this experience? Are you in a desert of depression? There's healing by the, from the great healer. Many had already died. And when Moses raised the serpent up upon, upon the pole, some would not believe that merely gazing upon the metallic image would heal them. These perished in their unbelief. Just try and imagine their plight. Why don't we want to look at the healer? Do we prefer complaining and living in misery? Papa, cries a little girl. If you look at the snake, Daddy, the snake on the pole, you will be healed, Daddy. Please look. Can you see her sobbing next to her unbelieving, dying father? There were many such cases. There are many such cases now. I found some ancient tombs of Muslims who were buried here at Bhutan. I also found graves of the martyrs during the Roman times here, and you're looking at it. Standing here, I was wondering how many tombs were erected for those who refused to look and live right here. Yet there were many who had faith in the provision which God had made. 
fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters were anxiously engaged in helping their suffering dying friends to fix their weary eyes upon the serpent. Daddy, look. Mommy, look. Son, daughter, look, look, look. There's life. And they look to the Saviour. If these, though faint and dying, could only once look, they would be perfectly restored. We have to look at Jesus the healer to heal us from our chronic sickness. The people well knew that there was no healing power in the serpent of brass to cause such a change in those who look upon it. The healing virtue was from God alone. There's healing in a look at the Saviour, my friend. In his wisdom, he chose this method of displaying his power. By the simple means, the people were made to realize that this affliction had been brought upon them by their sins. I'm responsible for the deeds I've done in the past. Not God. But he's such a kind, forgiving Saviour. They were also assured that while obeying God, they had no reason to fear, for he would preserve them. The lifting up of the brazen serpent was to teach Israel an important lesson. They could not save themselves from the fatal effect of poison in their wounds. I speak to many chronic sinners. <laughs> there are so many of us asking them just to look away from the mess, the problems in other people's lives. Just focus on Christ. Neither can you and I, my dear friend, purify ourselves from the poison of our fallen human nature. We need a healer. We are struggling to be healed by personal efforts. Look to him. He is the healer. The healing is not in us. I was telling my friends that God alone was able to heal them. Yet they were required to show their faith in the provision which he had made. What was that provision? Ancient Israel realized that they must look in order to live. They knew that there was no virtue in the serpent itself, as I said. But it was just a symbol of Christ. I told them that faith is the hand, the hand of faith, that grasps the healing power. If you need this healing power, take your hand of faith and grasp it. We must use that hand of faith more often. It's nothing in us, it's all in him. Go to him. Heretofore, many had brought their offerings to God, and there was a beautiful system in the Old Testament. And had they felt that in so doing they made ample atonement for, the, for their sins, they felt that uh, this was enough. They did not rely upon the Redeemer to come, of whom these offerings were only a type. The Lord would now teach them that their sacrifices in themselves had no more power or virtue than the serpent of brass, but were to lead their minds to Christ, the great sin offering. From a symbol we have to move to that which the symbol represents. So be careful not to rely on symbols as a mean of, means of salvation. You have to transcend the symbols to the great healer. I was asking them if they could remember the verse in the New Testament that refers to what happened right here at Bhutan. Can you tell me? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Nicodemus, so must the Son of Man, Christ referring to himself, be lifted up above the ground on that cross must be lifted up. Even so must the Son of God be lifted up 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Would you like to be healed? Go to Calvary and have a long look at what happened. It is quite an experience to visit this site and to realize that Jesus referred to the serpent that was elevate, elevated right here at Punon. We have all felt the deadly sting of that old serpent called the devil and Satan. We all felt it. The fatal effects of sin can be removed only by the provision God has made. The Israelites saved their lives by looking upon the uplifted serpent. Do you have any idea of the kind of prayer I prayed when visiting the site? I said, God, help me to see Christ on the cross. That's the only medication that can save me. So what happens to sinners like you and I when we look in faith to the crucified Christ? You know, we look at so many propositions. There's only one proposition. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious love and forgiveness. We receive pardon through faith in the atoning sacrifice. Unlike the motionless, lifeless symbol, Christ has power and virtue in himself to heal the repenting sinner. While the sinner cannot save himself, he still has something to do to secure salvation. What does, what's that? What do you think would it be? All that the Father gives me will come to me. Come to Jesus. And the one who comes to me, listen to this. I don't care what your situation is. And the one that comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Don't let the devil tell you you're too hopeless. He doesn't cast out hopeless sinners like you and me. He heals us. We must come to him. And when we repent of our sins, we must believe that he accepts and pardons us. Faith is the gift of God. But the power to exercise it is ours. Faith is the gift of God. But the power to exercise it is ours. Stones of Punon tell us more of the faith that was exercised right here. They replied, Faith is the hand by which the soul takes hold upon the divine offers of grace and mercy. Faith is the hand by which the soul takes hold of the divine offers of grace and mercy. Do you need it? Use your hand of faith and take it from God. He offers us offers it to you. Why doesn't everyone receive the bountiful blessings that God wants to shower on us? There are many who had long desired and tried to obtain these blessings, but have not received them, because they have cherished the idea that they could do something to make themselves worthy of them. They have not looked away from self, believing that Jesus is an all-sufficient Saviour. We must not think that our own merits will save us. Christ is the only hope of salvation. Don't look inside of you to solve the sin problem. It's outside of us.
For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only solution. Don't look at the pirates. Go to the genuine. When we trust God fully, when we rely upon the merits of Jesus as a sin pardoning Savior, we shall receive all the help we can desire. Let none look to self as though they had power to save themselves. This is the false gospel. Why did Jesus die for lost, unworthy sinners like you and me? Because we are helpless to save ourselves. In him is our hope, our justification, our righteousness. Everything is in Christ. Have you ever become despondent like the prodigal son while looking at the mess you've made? We've all made messes in life. When we see our sinfulness, we should not dis despond, despair and fear that we have no saviour or that he has no thoughts of mercy toward us. That's the demon speaking. He is inviting us to come to him in our helplessness and be saved. May I invite you to accept this, the greatest gift of all. Many of the Israelites saw no help in the remedy which heaven had appointed. The dead and the dying were all around them, and they knew that with our divine aid their own fate was certain. But they continued to lament their wounds, their pains, their sure death, until their strength was gone. And their eyes were glazed when they might have had instant healing. Don't let your eyes, my friend, be gazed. And don't die a lost person. Look and live. If we are conscious of our needs, we should not devote all our powers to mourning over them. While we realize our helpless condition without Christ, we are not to yield to discouragement, but rely upon the merits of a crucified and risen Saviour. Look and love, my dear friend. Here at Punon, where the Gospel was illustrated, I was reminded of the pledge God made to sinners. Jesus has pledged his word. He will save all who come unto him. And though millions who need to be healed will reject his offered mercy, not one who trusts in his merits will be left to perish. Not one. Many are unwilling to accept Christ until the whole mystery of the plan of salvation shall be made plain to them. They refuse to look the look of faith, although they see that thousands have looked and have felt the efficacy of looking to the cross. Many wander in a maze of philosophy. Terrible. In search of reasons and evidence which they will never find. Have you studied philosophy? While they reject the evidence which God has been pleased to give. Forget philosophy to save you. They refuse to walk in the light of the Son of Righteousness until the reason of its shining shall be explained. All who persist in this cause will fail to come to a knowledge of the truth that is found in Christ. Here at Punon, where the snakes appeared, I realized that God will never remove every occasion for doubt. But he gives us sufficient evidence on which to base our faith. And if this is not accepted, the mind is left in darkness. Don't die in spiritual darkness, my dear friend. If those who were bitten by the serpent had stopped to doubt the and question before they would consent to look, they would have perished. It is our duty first to look. And the look of faith will give us life. 
I know you think you're hopeless, but there's life in the look of faith. Only after Israel saw the message of the cross could they enter the promised land. You have to see the message of salvation on the cross of Calvary before you can enter the promised land. A symbol of the snake on the pole was erected out at Mount Nebu. Every time I visit there, I, I look at this symbol and I'm reminded of the gospel contained in the symbol. Israel were saved because they looked beyond the symbol and beheld the Christ of the symbol of Calvary. From now on, the story changes from defeat to victory. At the last, they learned the lesson of justification by faith. At last. Look upon Jesus, sinless is he. Father imputes his life unto me. My life of scarlet, my sin and woe, cover with his life, whiter than snow. You can have it just now. After they grasped the message of the cross, their complaining finally stopped. I looked carefully to their travels. Not one complained after they saw the cross. Is it possible to complain while we fix our eyes upon Christ? You know, it's, it's a good practice to spend some time every day to fix your eyes upon Jesus. Father in heaven, sorry for looking at the miserable side of life, the faults of others and our own faults. We've been bitten by the poisonous snake and we need healing. Help us to look in faith to the healer and help us to use the hand of faith to take salvation and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, Amen.